Welcome. This is a brief introduction to the task of item writing. Item writing is arguably the most important step in the test development cycle because it produces the basic building blocks of the test. It is also one of the most difficult steps, but some training and experience will help alleviate that. The purpose of this video is to provide such training. The goal, of course, is building exams or tests that are high quality, legally defensible, and produce reliable and valid score interpretations. An important aspect to consider in this is content validity. Uh, content validity refers to the actual content or the items of the test. That is, we need good test items that directly assess the knowledge or skills in question and provide little or no distraction or undue influence, which in testing parlance is called contract relevant variance, which we'll come back to. Even with all the psychometrics and advanced mathematics that is involved in testing, the quality of the test still lies primarily in the quality of its items. So the focus on this webinar will be to provide a discussion of some best practices in item writing. First of all, some terminology, beginning with the components of an item. An item it refers to the overall test question or an interactive way of assessing an examinee. And we use the term item because it's not always a question. It might be a statement with a rating of responses, or a scenario, or a innovative simulation. It might not just be a simple question, multiple choice, like you typically think of. The stem of the item, in this case mostly talking about multiple choice questions, is the initial part that presents the content of the item. That is, the top half of the question that says, okay, here's the information you need, and what are we trying to assess? Now, part of that stem uh, is often called a prompt or stimulus or asset. And this is the part that provides an exhibit of information. For example, you might have a pop-up reading passage or a set of maps that you need them to refer to or audio of somebody speaking. The option or alternatives of the items are the available answers that are down below and are available for examining to choose. The key refers to the correct option and distractor refers to incorrect options. Some other important terms are difficulty and discrimination. Uh, these are the two primary statistics utilized to evaluate the quality of items. Difficulty refers to how hard or easy the item is. So if it's an easy item, it's of low difficulty. and If it's hard, it's of high difficulty. Discrimination refers to how well the item differentiates amongst examinees. Now, discrimination often has a negative connotation, but in the context of psychometrics, discrimination is a very good thing because we want an item to differentiate among examinees. Because what we're trying to do, the whole purpose of the test, is to differentiate among examinees. We want to identify the examinees that have higher skills or knowledge. A response to an item is the recorded input of the examinee. For a typical multiple choice item, this is usually just the option that is selected, A, B, C, or D. It might be an essay for a writing test, and in the case of a speaking test, it might be a audio recording of spoken words. A multiple response item is a special type of item where you allow multiple responses for an examinee. For example, you might provide a medical scenario and they have to provide the two most likely diagnoses. And lastly, a rubric is a clearly defined set of criteria for scoring an item set to a scale of numbers. So this provides rules that relate student responses on open response items that aren't automatically scored to provide standards and content of the test so we have a framework in which we can evaluate the responses and provide some sort of numerical score for the item. Now, an important concept in item writing and psychometrics in general is constructive relevant variance. And the enemy of all tests is constructive relevant variance. Because the goal is that we want scores to reflect standing on the construct of interest, in this case, competency or knowledge or skills, uh, and not on any additional variables. Uh, this includes race or gender or knowledge of trivia or age or any other type of variables that can be attributed to candidates. And this also includes skills that are not involved with answering the question. So if you're trying to test knowledge of science, we don't want to involve reading comprehension skill, numeric ability, or reading speed in how people are able to answer the questions. So the first thing to focus on when item writing is to make sure that the content of the item maps to the blueprints as directly as possible. That is, we want to make sure we're measuring the construct 
that is competence or skill, well, we want to directly map the item to a specific point of the construct as directly as possible. Another consideration to minimize CIV is to be clear and concise. So when you're writing an item, make sure to provide all the information needed to answer that item, but do not provide any superfluous information. And I'll give an example of this later. Uh, an obvious suggestion is to make sure that formatting is clear as possible. And an important part of this is to follow all the rules of normal English grammar, regardless of what language you're using. Um, and I'll provide some more ex examples of that too. Now, you can also think of an item as a scientific experiment. When you're performing a scientific experiment, you typically want to hold all variables constant except your variable or variables of interest. In this case, uh, we don't want to know anything about somebody's reading comprehension or reading speed or numerical skill or skill with computers. We just want to know their knowledge of science or whatever it is you're trying to measure. So we want to try to minimize the impact those other variables will have on, on how candidates answer the question. So the purpose of an item is to differentiate between a competent and a non-competent examinee or a high or low examinee. Think about how each would approach the item. Top examinees, of course, will typically answer the item correctly. And lower examinees should answer it incorrectly, not because they are confused necessarily, but because they would not know the answer and would hopefully be attracted to one of the distractors, the incorrect answers. Now, one of the pieces to consider when doing this is to write your items of appropriate difficulty. While a very difficult item might be technically correct and actually quite good in terms of its content, it might not serve the purposes of a test if that purpose of the test is to measure minimal confidence, say, let's for a certification, especially an entry-level certification. So we don't want a very obscure, specific fact underlying the item if it's so obscure that it's going to be difficult uh, and hardly anyone's going to know the correct answer, even if it is a totally correct question. A key term here uh, when we're talking about uh, many types of exams or tests is a minimally competent candidate, which is a co candidate that is just barely qualified. Because in certification, licensure, and many other exams, the true purpose of the test is to separate an MCC, that is a competent candidate, from a person who is not qualified. In that case, the purpose of the test is not to identify experts. And this goes back to my previous point that we don't necessarily need very difficult items uh, that is, the items that would identify experts, if the purpose of the test is to assess minimal competence. Another thing to consider when writing items is to anticipate scoring. If you're using anything other than single best answer or multiple choice questions, such as partial credit scoring or innovative items, write the item around the scoring system. That is, if you want to have 0, 1, 2, or 3 points in a partial credit system, conceptualize an item at each level of competency or a response to each level of competency and write such an answer. Uh, if developing an innovative item type or simulation, from scratch that is, one of your first thoughts should be, how will this item be scored? Um, because you could have a really great idea of simulating a certain task, but if it's such a complex task that you can't break it down into certain elements that you can score, well then it's not going to do any good to include it as part of your exam. Uh, another important thing to consider is the recording of a rationale or source. Uh, whenever possible, record this behind an item and the correct answer. So not just the item overall, but the correct answer specifically. So an example of rationale might be, answer B is correct because the stem says this, a certain piece of information. C and D would not have an effect on this, and A might actually counteract it because of this. So this rationale would explain not only why answer B is correct, but why C, D, and A are incorrect. An example source would be a specific location uh, where you found uh, the information that is the key point that is being assessed by an item. Uh, for example, you might mention page 123 of the Jackson test, or regulation 127.6 of the city guidelines. So, you know, something specific like that. Uh, this not only serves as documentation of the validity of the item, that is, you know it's got content validity because it's related to a very specific source that's been regarded as one of the foundations of the industry, or the construct you're trying to measure, but it's also providing possible feedback for examinees, so that if you 
want to provide detailed feedback instead of just overall scores, you might say, okay, here's the items you got wrong, and here's the sources or the locations of the information that you got wrong. So, how to write an item. Well, first step is to identify a relevant situation or piece of necessary knowledge that you wish to evaluate. And this goes back to references and sources often. Because you need to match an item to a source anyway if you're doing a test that is based off of sources, it's much easier to come up with an item when staring at a list of professional guidelines or a textbook than it is if you're just staring at a blank sheet of paper. However, sometimes it also is good to stare at a blank sheet of paper because it allows some more creativity. And this also ensures that the item topic is at an appropriate level of competency or difficulty. So, some more information on multiple choice questions, which are the basic building block of most tests. Uh, there are two common formats for presenting a multiple choice item. Uh, the simpler format is to simply ask a question and list several possible answers. For example, you might say, what is the capital of Norway? You can see the stem is phrased as a direct question, and then each of the answers provides a phrase or a name that is possible answers to the question. The second format is to formulate the question as a sentence completion or a fill-in-the-blank type question. So you can see we have the same information, the same item, but it's formulated differently as a sentence completion. So the capital of Norway is Oslo, Bergen, Stavanger, or Stockholm. Uh, you can also do the same type of thing, but with a blank at the end there to fill in rather than um, listing the cities. Notice, though, that we're trying to make this grammatically correct. So on the top one here, there's a period at the end of each answer because there's no period in the stem. On the other hand, the lower one has a period in the stem because it's a complete sentence. In that case, each of the answers would not have a period. So as seen up there, we should follow these grammatical rules when, when possible. So that first item had a question mark that completed the stem, but the answers did not need punctuation. Whereas the second item did not have the punctuation completing the stem oh, in the first part that I presented. Instead, it was in the options. But either way, we have to have a period that is appropriately ending the sentence. Now, you should also make sure to capitalize appropriately. In this case, all of the answers are proper nouns, they're cities, so they're going to be capitalized. But capitalization is often not necessary. So you might have a sentence completion type of question where each of the answers is not capitalized because they're all just normal verbs or nouns. Now, some things you should do with each item that you write. First of all, make sure that the key is correct. This is obvious, but it's surprising that it is actually mixed quite often, both in item writing and in review. Uh, next, make sure that the distractors are incorrect, but yet plausible. They shouldn't be completely out of the ballpark. So with that previous question of for the capital of Norway, uh, note that all of the cities were Scandinavian cities. You wouldn't necessarily want to include New York or Tokyo or Singapore on that list of capital cities or possible capital cities of Norway. Another point is to review your stem and make sure all necessary information is there. That is, you, you present information in the stem. And you want to make sure that you have the, all the information that the examinee needs. You know, there could be just a very small part that you forgot to mention, like take the total of this column or take the average of this column. But make sure it's all there and make sure that there's no superfluous information too, if you can reduce that. And lastly, make sure that the question part of the stem is clear in what sort of response it is driving at. This is especially true in open response items, um, that you want to be as specific as possible in requiring the response from the examinee. So, now that I've presented some overall guidelines here, I'm going to go through a few specific guidelines and some counterexamples for those. However, note that all these are only guidelines and best practices. In some cases, it is okay to break some of these guidelines, um, but not very often. First guideline and counterexample. Avoid clues and cues for the test taker, even subtle ones. An example of this is the use of an or a in a sentence completion. For example, down here, we have a large land mammal is an well, because it's an instead of a, we obviously know that it fits grammatically correctly with a word that begins with a vowel. And of the four answers, there's only one word that begins with a vowel, and that's elephant. So it's the only grammatically possible answer in this case, and that could clue off an examinee. 
Now, it seems kind of obvious here, um, but there is examples of this that you will come across as you write items. Another example is to avoid not all of the above, none of the above, or the A and B only, or B and C only types of items. The reason is that because these are often distracting and confusing, and they therefore introduce construct relevant variants. An example of this here is which of the following cities is not in Texas? Dallas, Houston, Little Rock, or San Antonio? You can see it's a not question, um, so it requires somebody from thinking positively throughout the rest of the test to thinking negatively here. Now, a common type of item that you'll come across is all of the above items. Fixing all of the above items is often quite difficult, but there's a few suggestions here. First is to make all of the above item into a single answer by setting one of the answers as correct and flipping the rest to incorrect. Uh, for example, you might ask, which of the following is a city in Texas? in which case you only have one correct that is, is in Texas and three that are incorrect. You could also make answers into combinations by actually writing out the terms with more than one of them in each option. This is similar to the previous suggestion, but actually makes the item more difficult. So in this case, you might ask, which of the following are cities in Texas? And each answer is going to have two cities, and only one of the four answers has both of the cities in Texas. Some of the answers might have one city in Texas, which makes it a little more difficult, so the examinees really have to pay close attention. Lastly, if you can't think of any plausible incorrect answers, which is sometimes the case, try flipping the stem in options. So instead of as asking uh, which of the following is a city in Texas, you might ask Dallas is a city in what state, and then the answers would be Texas and three other states. Another recommendation is to check grammar and punctuation. A uh, common piece of punctuation that's not necessary is a trailing colon in the stem. And you should also make sure to include the periods and the answers when relevant, like I mentioned earlier. So in this example, we have the capital of Kentucky is colon Lexington, Louisville, Frankfurt, or Bowling Green. Well, that colon at the end of the stem is not needed if it's sentence completion, because if it was the simple sentence, the capital of Kentucky is Frankfurt, there would be no colon in that sentence. But there would be a period at the end of the sentence, so each of the answers should have a period at the end. You should also try to keep stems as short as possible and be clear and concise with no extra information, like I had mentioned, especially information that could impact responses or distract the examinees. An example here is the capital of Kentucky was selected as a political compromise for being nearly equidistant from the two flagship cities of the state. The name of the capital is, well, you can see it's grammatically correct here, but we now presented a lot more information in the stem. And this actually kind of gives away half of the question because it mentions being nearly equidistant from the two flagship cities of the state. People from that area might know that the flagship cities of the state are Lexington and Louisville, which means that neither of those are the capital, which automatically then reduces the question to being Frankfurt or Bowling Green. So all of the information presented in this question is correct, um, but we've presented more information than we needed to, and that's given away part of the question. Another point is to emphasize principles, scenarios, or actual decisions rather than trivial facts. Uh, it's a rut that's very easy to fall into when you're writing knowledge items, especially if you're pulling pieces of information out of a textbook or regulations or other written documentation. Example here, uh, in the 2010 census, Madison, Wisconsin had a population of blank. You know, if this was a test on the geography of Wisconsin, um, you know, even though this is this question fits into the geography of Wisconsin, it's trivial information. It doesn't really reflect necessarily comprehension of geography in the state of Wisconsin. Another point is to make sure that your choices do not overlap if you are using ranges. For the example below, what if the answer was 2? And I have here, for situation x, the widget should be calibrated to blank millimeters. Is it 1 to 2, 2 to 3, 3 to 4, or 4 to 5? Well, if the actual answer was 2, or 3, or 4, it would be right on the borderline of two options. Um, so if you're using ranges like this, make sure that the choices do not overlap. Next guideline is to evenly distribute the key among possible locations. 
And the reason I suggest this is because when you're writing an item, you tend to write the stem and then you think of the correct answer first. So you fill in the correct answer and of course the first blank as you're writing the item is under A. So often the tendency will be have A as the correct answer and then B, C, or D will not have as many incorrect answers on the test. On the other hand, there's the urban legend of always choosing C. Item writers might avoid this initial pitfall and then tend to choose C for whatever reason. So uh, if you're writing items, it might be good to specifically rotate this. When I write items, I will write item 1 to have an answer of A, item 2 as an answer of B, 3 of C, 4 of D, and then I cycle again. So item 5 has an answer of A, item 6 has an answer of B, and so on. Another point is to remember that distractors can affect difficulty as much as the key. They should be relevant uh, because relevant distractors will just make the item way too easy, such as that example with the ca capital of Norway of having cities that aren't even in Europe. On the other hand, you don't want distractors that are too similar because they make the item too difficult, especially if the similarity is construct relevant. So, for example, the capital of Vermont is blank, and we have four different snellings of Montpelier. Well, if the test is a basic geography test and you want people to know their state capitals, you don't necessarily care about whether they can spell Montpelier. You want to uh, make sure that they know that Montpelier is the capital of Vermont. So you shouldn't have items or answers that are too close like this. Also, options should be of similar, similar length or format. And this actually is a very common issue because item writers will tend to make the key or the correct answer a little more detailed than the incorrect answers or include some sort of qualifier like um, as instructed in the manual or something like that at the end of it, which makes it a little longer and makes it stand out a little bit. So example of this, longest river system in North America is the blank, Columbia, Mississippi, Missouri, Colorado, or Yukon. Well, B stands out because it's the only one that's hyphenated with two different river names. Even somebody who is guessing would be more likely to choose B than any of the others. Another guideline is to avoid always and never in your stems because there might be rare or unanticipated cases. A simple example of that is in New York, it never snows in June. Well, it might ha never have been recorded, but it could be possible that at some point it's going to snow in New York in June, or it has snowed in New York in June. You don't want to include never in the stem of this question. Next guideline is to balance options when feasible. Uh, in the example here, we should have two yes and two no. So in your medical assessment role, while checking in the patient, they complain of chest pains. Should you notify the doctor? And we have four answers. One of them is yes. Three of them are no. Well, that really makes that first one stand out because it's the only one that's yes. So it'd be a little more feasible in this case to balance with two yes and two no, if possible. And related to that is you want to avoid options that naturally group together that produce the same problem just by the reasoning of the examinee because it reduces the number of available options. So travel faster than the speed of sound is called blank, supersonic, subsonic, sonic, or stratospheric. Well, anyone with um, limited knowledge of this is going to key in on supersonic or subsonic because it's super and sub are above or below, and stratospheric is related to the atmosphere, so it could immediately be thrown out. So such a person would key in on A and B, and then, even if they didn't know anything else, be able to uh, have a coin flip or a 50-50 chance between A and B. The next recommendation is to avoid repetition of a text in each option. So put it in the stem if possible, so it is printed on the piece of paper or on the computer screen only once. So the front of the ship is called the bow, stern, port, or beam, would be a lot better way of formulating this question, because we repeated is called the in each of the answers. Well, we can just move that up to the stem so it is only used once. Another guideline is to avoid idioms or other limited use or esoteric terminology. So, for example, the two companies, the two companies negotiated all day regarding small points of the contract because they each considered the final price to be the thousand pound gorilla in the room, the best part of the day, easiest thing to negotiate, or icing on the cake. And some of these are just pure idioms of American English, in which case um, they don't necessarily make a good answer to the question. 
Another point is to think about the content. Would any subgroup be potentially disadvantaged? So on, I was getting to in that last case is that if you're using, let's say, an Amer American English idiom, anyone who's not raised uh, natively speaking American English would be disadvantaged at that question. Well, you should also give that same amount of attention to other types of subgroups, you know, where people live in the world, the background they grew up in, um, the culture they grew up in, things like that, and make sure that the test or item is as limited as possible and that it doesn't require any outside information that could impact like that. An example of that here is suppose you're working on a national medical exam, you don't want to ask a question about scorpion bites because let's say, you know, there's only scorpions in one small part of portion of the country and 95% of the doctors are never going to see a scorpion bite. Well, that might be a very poor item to put on national exam. So that concludes uh, the guidelines that I was going to cover here today. Now, you should also remember that an important part of item development is item review. That is, you might be asked to review items from other writers before they go out for live use. And the main points are still relevant here. So if you've, you're taking other people's items to review, you're viewing them, you should check the same things that you were considering yourself when writing these items, such as making sure that the key is correct, making sure that the distractors are incorrect but plausible and that the answers are grammatically correct, uh, that there, all the information is, that is necessary is available in the stem, that the question part is clear in what sort of response it's driving at, that the content is linked to blueprints and a reference if that's required, that the item is of appropriate difficulty, that is, it's not too easy or too hard for the intended audience, and that it doesn't have any of the issues that are presented here today, such as being all of the above type of question. So, as a summary, there are best practices involved in writing items. Writing item is both a science and an art. That is, it, there's these best practices that have been based on scientific research, but there really is an art into phrasing items well that really measure well. Um, and this takes practice. So I presented some initial guidelines here, but I encourage you to write questions of your own and review other people's questions, and that will really help you better understand some of the types of issues that go into item writing. Now, if you have any more questions about item writing or the test development process, there are more resources available at www.assess.com, which is the homepage of Assessment Systems Corporation. Thank you.